And so therefore you have the option of um, turning off your videos. Okay, so tonight uh, we're dealing with the third week's topic on the parliament, the role of the upper house in a parliamentary democracy. And after the session, you should be able to discuss and explain responsible government in the context of the Australian Commonwealth and the representative principle in Australian constitutionalism. Now, before we start talking about tonight's topic, by going through the weekly discussion questions, perhaps there are some questions that you might have relating to this topic or the previous topics or any question you might have on the assessment or anything else about the course. Done? Okay, so I guess we could, yes. Hey, Manja. Yes. Have you released uh, Jacob? Ah, uh, Jacob, have yes. You yeah, hi. Have you released it yet, the paper, the, the assessment? Yes, um, I, will be, I will be releasing it tomorrow. Okay. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Manja, I had a yes. question um, just from a last week. It's just <laughs> Luke here. Luke, yes. Uh, I just had a question relating to the Constitution, but I'll leave that till the end of the, um, the session if I can. Okay, yes. So um, just make sure you don't forget it. Okay. Um, so I've got a comment from Tiffany where the task sheet is, and I suppose by that, Tiffany, you're, you're asking the same question that Jacob asked as to the actual legal memorandum assessment questions. Uh, if so, I will be releasing them tomorrow. Yeah, ah, so same question, that's right. Okay, so let's begin. So discussion question one, and again, I wish to uh, point out, and just as a reminder, that for the purpose of picking up marks for the group discussion, you will only get marks if you actually uh, join the tutorial discussions. In other words, you need to pick up the mic and engage in a discussion by answering the questions or providing your comments. Near attendance at our tutorial sessions or posting your answer to the chat box will not lead to any marks. But again, in the alternative, if you wanted to get marks for group discussion, you can always answer the at least you know, a, a Moodle discussion question according to the marking criteria that is set out in the course profile. And uh, you're only, you're only uh, given the requirement that you should, only, you should answer five questions throughout the term. So I guess we could begin. Um, so. Question one, under the principle of responsible government, and let me just check that I'm recording this. Seem to be. I just want to be sure, hang on. Okay, we are recording this. So, under the principle of responsible government, the governor general acts on the advice of the prime minister. By what legal authority would the Governor General have to dismiss a Prime Minister who refuses to tender the resignation of his ministry? Can I have um, a volunteer or some volunteers who can attempt to answer um, this question? Yeah, I'd like to, that's right. That's Adam? Yes, it is, yeah. Adam, go ahead, please. Um, so in kind of response to this question, my thought process, I think, was, I think it was um, Governor General John Kerr, mm -hmm. that in support of his inquiry to the High Court, as per him being able to, um, under Section 64 of the Constitution, administer departments of the State of the Commonwealth. So in essence, I think that means appoint them. Um, a reserve power of the opposite somewhat of that would be that he would also have the power to dismiss them in times where under responsible government they probably should have elected to resign to the uh, Prime Minister. Okay, so uh, I heard your argument about the power of the uh, Governor General to appoint on the basis of Section 64, but where lies the power yep. to remove them? Um, I think it's by convention. So is it by convention or under 64? Um, well, 64 states that how, how he has the power to appoint them, but I think on the flip side of that, it's by convention that naturally he would have the power to also dismiss them. So can you make an argument on the basis of, of Section 64, or 
is the convention that you're referring to tied to section 64. Are they one and the same um, or are they separate without necessarily being linked to each other? That's my question. Oh, okay. Well, my thought process was that by convention it was linked to 64. Okay. So if it is based on 64, it is not by convention. The power of the governor general there, therefore would rest on a constitutional provision. But then again, if it's based on 60, section 64, you mentioned that section 64 recognizes the power of the governor general to appoint um, mem key members of the government. But it does not say that it has, that the governor general has the power to dismiss. Now, on the other hand, you mentioned oh, okay. that uh, by convention, the governor general has the power to dismiss. Now, if it's by convention, then you're not relying on the constitution. So I'm just trying to get a clarity here. Uh, that was kind of my understanding of the um, whole Gough Whitlam situation in 74. I thought it was through the um, under 64 that John Kerr was able to dismiss that government. Okay. L let me just point out some, uh, something here. Some, my task is actually to try to probe uh, you know, your answer to force you to kind of come up with an argument. Don't back off just because I'm asking questions. Okay, you're actually... Yeah, no, I'm, yeah, I'm still actually, trying to think out of it. You're actually on the right track. I'm just... Oh, okay, know, yeah. That's, that's, my, that's my style. Um, yeah. That's the, the Socratic method anyway, is to probe you know, your level of understanding for the purpose of us getting some elucidation. Okay, you're on the right track, but I'll give uh, a chance to somebody. I think I saw someone raise her hand, but I, that disappeared. There was somebody who raised her hand. Um, was it Megan? Yes, Megan, if you could. Oh. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, I could. Um, my understanding of it was that the Governor General has um, the power to dismiss a Prime Minister, um, like through convention, but um, it's like under a reserve power. Mm. So the, the power of the governor general to appoint ministers is on the basis of a reserve power. Is that it? No, no, no. Um, to dismiss a ah. prime minister. The power to dismiss. Would be on the basis of a reserve power. Okay. Now, before we go there, and I will pursue that point, Megan, I'd like to pursue first the a point raised by Adam that Section 64 provides or gives the Governor General the power to appoint uh, officers to administer such departments of the state of the Commonwealth. My question is, on the basis of that provision, could that provision actually be used as a basis to argue that you know, he can terminate uh, key officers of uh, departments of the state. No, so the, so the hands were, God, sorry, uh, before I get to you, I saw the hand of Kim Easton being raised, if you don't mind. I'd like to acknowledge Kim first, and then we could probably go to you. Kim? Hi, man. Um, I think if I was going to argue that 64 does provide a power to dismiss as well as a point, I would point to the second part where it says, such officers shall hold office during the pleasure of the Governor General. And I wonder if, if that means that they, only, they can only continue to hold the power while the Governor um, General has confidence in them. And if he loses that confidence or removes his pleasure, using a very old term, then um, I, I suspect, well, I would argue that that, that section of it gives him the power to remove them. Very good. Now that is the kind of argument I want to hear. See, so that is the way it is, you know, so it will be insufficient for you to just say under section 64, the governor general has the power to appoint. As, as argued by Kim, the power of appointment should also carry the power to remove, especially because the same provision recognizes that the tenure of office of a person appointed by the governor general uh, continues for as long as he has the pleasure of the governor general. So the recognition of uh, the, the continuing tenure of a, a person appointed by the governor general recognizes the power to dismiss. So in other words, what I am suggesting to you, especially in the context of preparing the, uh, the legal memorandum as well as the, well, the Moodle discussion questions and even the final written assessment later on, you need to make an argument. 
You need to explain it. And Kim gave a perfect example of how you make an argument. So he started with a provision, very clear, and then he stated why an argument could be made, why the power to appoint and the, power, and the fact that uh, they serve during the pleasure of the governor general is actually a, an affirmation of the power of the governor general to dismiss. So that's good. Well done, Kim. Now, I'd like to, so we've covered that. My question is, assuming section 64 did not exist, okay? Now, what we, what we need to remember is that it is not just Australia which has a, a parliamentary system of government or which has the Westminster style of parliamentary government. The UK and New Zealand also have parliamentary systems of government. And in these two jurisdictions, they do not have any constitution, okay? So there is nothing like Section 64, simply because they don't have written constitutions. Now, New Zealand does. Okay, so New Zealand came up with a written constitution, but it is not the founding constitution that Australia has in terms of the way that the Federation of the Commonwealth was founded. So the uh, New Zealand constitution, while it embodies the important human rights that are recognized, it is not fundamental law of the land. It is just a, uh, an enactment of parliament which means, therefore, that it could be changed by a simple act, again, of Parliament passing a law that changes the Constitution. So, having said that, assuming that there were no Constitution, no written Constitution, like, that we have in the, like the one that we have in Australia, how then do jurisdictions such as the UK and Australia go about the process of having a Prime Minister removed from office if, there were no uh, provision in the written constitution enabling the governor general or the queen to remove, the, in the case of the UK, to remove the prime minister. So how, how, how is that done? Um, I'd like to go to Scott, perhaps Scott, if you want to, otherwise I'll go to Megan. I so kind of saw her trying to turn her mic on. Unless you want to tell the answer, Scott. Yeah, um, I think that would be by convention where the, the executive has lost the um, support of the lower house uh, so where they, they refuse to supply money you know to consolidated revenue or refuse to or pass a, a bill of um, uh, you know of no faith in the government mm. okay so it is by convention so but in relation to the governor general where's the power there so there seems to be a well, process, yes? Yeah, well, that would be by convention because uh, the Governor-General is the head of, the, of, you know, is the monarch's representative in the country. Mm. So historically under the, the Westminster system, uh, the, the monarch had uh, overall power and she delegated duties and, and so on and so forth to, to ministers, mm. but she, had, she was able to abdicate uh, the, or adjudicate uh, all of her powers and functions, and and she had the she could um, either appoint or, or remove ministers. Very good. Now, Scott, because you mentioned convention, we kind of discussed this last week. But can you just remind us again what do we mean by convention, and why is convention a source of legal authority in the first place? Well, convention is basically. Um, not habit, but it's it's precedent. It's what's been done uh, repeatedly over the years that it just becomes standard practice without actually being a, a documented rule or a documented guide as to how to do something. It's just standard practice, and that's the way it's done. Which has the force of law. Yeah, yeah, it has the force. It's, a, it's almost like, for, for sort of a poor analogy, it's almost like common law. So this was number four, mm -hmm. and we'll carry on doing this, and, mm -hmm. and that's all. It's like precedent almost. Very good. Well done. Um, hang on. Let me just put some notes here. I still have been speaking because I might forget. Now, my apologies to those who are putting things in the chat box. Again, I'm a kind of a single-track-minded person. I really have difficulty, you know, talking, engaging with you on Zoom and then reading on the chat box. I will try to do it if I could, but um, because I'd like to engage those um, who are speaking, that can sometimes uh, make it difficult for me to read through what's in the chat box. So my apologies in advance. Um, now, 
Because somebody said, Samantha said, no idea. Samantha, did you want to care to explain that? Oh, is it in relation to what Gemma said? Perhaps. Okay. One of you, and I can't remember who it was, said something about the reserve powers. So we've mentioned that potentially, so again, what we're doing here is trying to come up with a comprehensive answer to discussion question one. So somebody said, um, section, section 64, uh, was Adam and then Kim, uh, who mentioned that section 64 uh, gives the Governor General the power to dismiss. Uh, and then um, Scott talked about the uh, the convention, the conventional practice, which uh, recognizes the power of the governor general to dismiss the uh, prime minister. Now, somebody, I don't know if it was Adam, who mentioned as well the notion of reserve powers. Okay. Can somebody enlighten us? What has the so-called re reserve powers got to do with the idea of the governor general's power to remove, dismiss a prime minister? Can somebody try to explain that for us? Monica, yes. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Um, well, the I, reserve I, 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 power I, 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 is... Last name, Monica. Sorry. Uh, Monica Thompson. Thompson. Okay, thank you, Monica. Monica. So the reserve power is something that can be exercised by the executive that doesn't actually need approval from the rest of the government. Okay. In my answer, I put um, more that um, because it's an unwritten, it's vested in the executive that he can remove the prime minister. So it's um, it's a power that he has as the Queen's representative, basically. Mm, okay, uh, but let's let it begs the question: What exactly is a reserve power? What is that? Uh, by the way, let me just point out, oh, so, sorry, um, I, I, it's just a, a, a clarification of the rules. If you provide an answer in the Zoom um, sessions and they're genuine, you do it right, you, get, you, do, you give a right answer or a wrong answer, you will still get the full two points. I just want to clarify that. Okay, so whether the answer is right or wrong, you will get the full two points for going through the trouble of uh, attempting to answer. Okay, and whether or not the answer is, even if the answer is wrong, it's actually an opportunity for everyone to learn. Okay, and as I said, I'll never embarrass anyone. Okay, so Monica, if you could, you know, could you probably just elaborate more about reserve powers of the Governor General or the Executive? What, what is that? I sort of took it to mean um, a little bit like tradition because it goes back to um, into the UK where the Queen, because they don't have a constitution, if that if a similar problem was to arise there, the Queen would have that ability to remove the Prime Minister, I would assume. So I thought it was sort of like a um, tradition. Mm, okay. Um, okay. Um, you, you're, you're kind of right there, but I'm not satisfied. I'm not, I don't think it's a full answer, but that's good. But before I do that, I see a question here from Gemma. How do you put your hand up for a question? Is it somewhere there? And there's Chantelle um, raising her hand as well. Um, how do you raise your hand anyway? Uh, if you click on participants, um, it gets a list of everyone in the class. And then you'll see next to your name, there's a picture of a hand. If ah. you click, oh no, maybe down the bottom, you can click raise hand. Thank you. That's good. Thank you, Kim. So I haven't, well, I've used it probably before myself, but my tendency is to just jump into the fray instead of raising my hand. So. I mean, when I have meetings, during our law meetings, law discipline meetings, if I wanted to say something, we just jump into the fray without having to raise my hand. So I haven't really gotten used to the idea of using the, the, uh, one of the icons there. So um, would somebody want to uh, tell us more about reserve powers? I wonder if it's Gemma who wants to do that, or could it be somebody else? Yes, I'd like to say something. Yes, Gemma, please. I um, went on to the Governor-General's official website and it says um, there are powers which the Governor-General can in certain circumstances exercise without or contrary to ministerial advice known as reserve powers. 
and they include the power to appoint a prime minister if an election has resulted in a hung parliament, the power to dismiss a prime minister where he or she has lost the confidence the confidence of parliament or has acted unlawfully, mm. and the power to refuse mm. to dissolve the House of Representatives despite a request from the prime minister. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to point out something uh, based on what Gemma said, and thank you, Gemma, for that. Because I've seen this happen in some of the answers to the Bundle discussion questions. There are some students who end up citing, say, a journal article written by some professor, written by you know, some other scholar, or they would cite, it could be a website from the Attorney General's office. Now, remember, the, uh, these by themselves are not actually sources of authority. If you cite the Constitution, or if you cite a high court decision, or perhaps or the federal court, then you've cited legal authority. Uh, these would typically be primary authority, and we recognize them uh, to be, uh, you know, sources of legal authority, therefore, that we rely upon. But when we cite a website, even coming from the Attorney General, especially if it's the Attorney General, that's, which is therefore part of the executive, in terms of uh, its being a source of legal authority, it's not. Okay, and neither would obviously be secondary sources such as journals. So having said that, the point is, it is important that, one, that if you were to cite a, a journal article or if you were to cite a website, you need to be able to come up with the argument or explanation why what they're saying actually makes sense or what they're saying is actually valid. Okay, so the Attorney General says that there is one of the reserved powers. And I go back to that basic question. What is a reserved power and on what basis can we say that there exists a reserved power on the part of the Governor General to be able to dismiss a prime minister who refuses to tender the resignation of his ministry, in, even if he loses the support of the parliament. So I go back to my basic question there. What do we mean by the reserve power? And what is the basis for a statement that there exists such a reserve power? I will have a go at what is a reserved power. Yes, Sarah. Okay. Um, from my understanding, it is a power that is exercised independent of ministry advice. Okay, Maybe. go on. Okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'll try to before I lose my voice. Um, no, I can't okay. talk. <laughs> Now, um, I, I hope you don't get intimidated by me asking questions, probing questions, because, you know, I think it's a good practice when you'll be practicing in courts. The judge is going to ask you to explain your position. So um, it's a good practice. Now, I saw the hands of Jacob and some other student. Can't see who it was. Was it Chantel? Perhaps we could begin with Chantel. Chantel, I kind of saw your, you raising your hand, but the notice has disappeared. Did you want to say something, Chantel? Yes, can you hear me? I could, yes. Um, a reserve power is a, an inherent power. Go on. A power, a power that doesn't need to be specified um, or have constitution or statute. It's just something that you should be able to do, such as enter contracts or um, mm -hmm. treaties with other nations. Very good. Why? But why? Why must you have it? Why is that inherent? Uh, because it would be ridiculous to have to go to someone else to make a, a statute for every single thing that you need to do. Okay, that's one. What else? How else can you argue that? The notion of inherent powers. Why must it be, why must it be inherent in the executive? Okay, so the idea of reserve powers, or is it Kim? Yes, Kim. Thank you, Chantal. That was good. Um, um, sorry, I, I may be wrong here. My, my understanding of the reserve powers is, is a throwback to, um, to our time as part of uh, the British Empire. Originally, the, the monarchy, of course, had absolute power, mm. and that power was eroded over time, and eventually a parliament, parliamentary system was established in England. Mm. When that happened, nearly all of those absolute powers were vested in the parliament, but Her Majesty or the monarch at the time, of course, 
retained some powers which were described as being the reserve powers of the monarchy. My understanding is it's those powers that they're referring to when they're talking about the reserve powers of the Governor General. It's the inherent powers of Her Majesty that haven't been divested to the Parliament. And I think it makes sense if you don't accept that Section 64 gives the Governor General power to uh, remove uh, a government for the reasons the others have mentioned, for a practical reason, that the, the, the monarchy, the Governor General, should have a power to remove a government that isn't able to operate as a government because they've lost confidence, for example. That's good. So thank you, Kim. That was a perfect answer again. And that was a historical way of uh, providing the explanation. The other aspect of it is that when you look, when you examine the notion of executive powers, surely you don't need, as pointed out by Chantal, you don't need a, a statutory provision which has to, to be able to recognize uh, what the, 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 the executive can or cannot do. For, for the executive to fully execute its mandate, to execute uh, the laws and maintain the constitution, there has to be a recognition that there are certain inherent things that it can do. Certain, reserve, the, certain powers that are reserved in the executive for it to be able to fulfill its functions, to be able to fulfill its roles. Okay, because otherwise, if these, reserve, if these powers are not reserved in the executive, then where do they lie? They're not with the judiciary, they're not with the parliament. So who exercises them? So they have to be reserved somewhere. They have to be reserved with the executive because that is consistent with the power of the executive to execute the laws of the country and maintain the constitution. Okay? Clear? So good. So we have three reasons there, and I won't go through them anymore because it's 6.30. So, but it's actually six, 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 we have six, section 64. We have the uh, conventional practice, and then we have the notion of reserve power. So these are three possible arguments you can, you can make to show uh, that the Governor General uh, actually has the power to dismiss a Prime Minister who refuses to tender the resignation of his ministry. Good, well done, thank you. Now, question two. Ratnapala and Crow said that it is an ancient common law, it is an ancient common law of constitutionalism that courts do not interfere in the internal processes of Parliament. What does this practice of non-interference mean? Uh, Megan, I'll go back to your question in a short while. Uh, you've got a question there, uh, but I, I can't think of it, about it while I look at question two. But thank you for that. I'm going to go back to it in a short while. Discussion question two. Any, anyone uh, would like to attempt an answer? Question two. So, does this mean that it comes no. under the um, separation of powers, Manjo? Go ahead, go ahead, yes. What about uh, it? Well, uh, when I read the quote, it was pretty much how I pictured it, is that it's talking about the separation of powers and how since they've pretty much, you know, gone through history and, you know, now we have it in Australia, um, that's pretty much the basis of that quote is how I saw it. Okay, but uh, so, so, well, what does that got to do with the separation of powers? Can you explain that for us? Sorry, so, can you just repeat that? Uh, so what has the, the concept or the notion of separation of powers got to do with the, the, with the concept that courts do not interfere in the internal processes of parliament? So what I'm saying is, please explain. So in this okay. manner, if you have, you know, if you have answered the Moodle discussion question forum or uh, the legal memorandum, don't just make a statement, explain it. So I need an explanation. What has this got to do with uh, the notion of separation of powers? Um, I would say it's the, actually, I'm not 100% sure on that. No, I'm, That's all right. Yeah. Um, try to explain. Yes, I'll, 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 I'll give Luke just a little bit more time. Luke, give it a go. Why is this related to the idea of uh, separation of powers? What has that got to do with interference in the internal processes of parliament? Um, well, the court won't interfere with the internal processes because of the, the separation of powers. 
separating the judiciary from the legislature. Uh. Um, so courts won't actually make laws or say that, uh, sorry, the, uh, the legislator won't actually make judgments and that sort of thing. Uh. Okay, you're getting there. Thank you. Uh, but you gave up too soon, Luke. You gave up too soon. But you're there. Can somebody attempt an answer? Yeah, is it an explanation? Well, uh, Scott here. Scott, yes. Yes, um, go ahead, Scott. So, so Westminster system. We've got the legislator, legislature, and the executive, which which um, make, administer, enforce the law, hmm. and then. The judiciary which in, interpret and apply the law so mm. the judiciary is not going to get him uh, will not be involved in in the making or the administering uh, uh, of, of the law mm. they'll just be involved at the outcome to in the validity or lawfulness of the law made by the okay. judiciary made by the executive okay but I need you to link it back to the question that's fine but Please link it back to the well, and, and that's why it's it, it's not interference because it's not it's not up to the judiciary to to actually write the law or to say this is a better law or that's a better law. That's the will of the people through their executive and and uh, legislature to to make the law, and the judiciary will uh, will in, interpret it or make an assessment on its validity. Okay, so I, I got that part, but my question is, what has that got to do with the idea that courts do not interfere in the internal processes of parliament? Well, well, if they're interfering with, within parliament, they're not, they're, they're not adhering to the separation of powers. Ah, they're, they're, okay, so that's the way you're arguing. They're, then they're then becoming the, the executive and the legislature by, ah. uh, by writing the law. I so you, you wouldn't have separation of powers thing. Very good. In fact, um, Janet Bracken uh, was pointing out Cormac versus Co as the um, as the uh, the legal authority for the statement. But I saw somebody raise the hand again. The icon keeps on disappearing. Did I see the word the name of Nick there? Nick, no, hi man, John. This is Nick. Sorry, I'll put my yes, hand down Nick. now. Okay. Um, I've just been doing some, some hurried research in Westlaw and, and everything. Yes. Um, a bit of food. Been referred to section 50 and 49 of the constitution um, uh, in respect to this. So it talks about uh, for the parliament's internal practices, section 50, I think, seems to be the biggest authority on this to say that uh, each house of parliament may make rules and orders with respect to how it conducts its business. Mm. Uh, when you look at that in terms of section 52, which gives an exclusive power, mm. Um, that then becomes an exclusive power of the parliament and not something which the uh, judiciary can can interfere with. Okay, very good. Now, my, my question is this. So what if there is a, uh, a power struggle in parliament and it can't be determined, for example, who should be the prime minister or, you know, who should be a, a member of cabinet? In the same way, we had a problem in, almost a problem in the state of Queensland, was it a year ago, when there were some judges and justices who were very much against the appointment of um, Chief Justice Carmody. And let's assume that, you know, uh, somebody in the courts uh, took it upon themselves to kind of unseat somebody. Would, so in the case of parliament or the executive, would they have had cause to deal with the struggles of a, another branch of government or not? Um, do, do you see my point there? Trying to extend the analogy here. So, so what's, what exactly is the point here? So the point that we're making is that um, because of the notion of separation of powers, the, a, a, an, one branch of government will avoid really inter getting involved with the internal affairs of a co-equal branch of government. It will leave it to that co-equal branch of government to sort things out. Because otherwise, if it were to be the arbiter of who should be leading what, then they're interfering. They're putting themselves above a branch of government that is meant to be co-equal. So they're going to have to back off and say, 
we're not gonna get involved because it is something that you as a co-equal branch of government must decide for yourselves, okay? It can kind of leave a vacuum in the process because we don't know, there's a little bit of uncertainty, but we recognize that in a democracy, uh, there are no perfect answers all the time and we leave it to the institutions themselves to sort out certain internal processes. Okay, and that's a statement by Cormac uh, versus Cope. Okay, and uh, from Jan Natir, it is not for this court to prevent Parliament from doing okay. Now, I'm not sure if that is relevant. If, if not, that's directly relevant uh, to what we were discussing, but th that's a good point there from Janet. Okay, so was that clear? So if, if you were to move the example, what if there was a, a, a uh, so let's, let's assume that in the high court, this is just a theoretical example, okay? So I don't want to get into trouble here. But let's just assume as a theoretical example that some justices of the high court felt aggrieved or were disgusted by the actions of a fellow uh, justice of the high court. Okay? Now the question is, what if they decided to uh, remove a justice of the high court, a fellow justice of the high court? Would they have had the power to do that? Would parliament intervene? Or how would that, how would that work? Could it be done? Can somebody attempt that question? I, I raise that point because if you notice, um, because I mentioned, I already flagged that in the legal memorandum problem, we're kind of focusing on Turkey. Okay, so we have Turkey as an example where President Erdogan actually, uh, so that again, the legal memorandum kind of uses the Turkey example as an analogy to what will happen in Australia. But the relevant, so in the case of Turkey, President Erdogan uh, of Turkey uh, removed about 2,700 judges of the, of the courts. But actually, it wasn't done directly. It was done through, you know, the high court judges themselves removing their fellow judges. Okay. My question is, what if because of a power struggle, or because of the disgust of some high court judges, they ended up, they wanted to unseat or remove from office a fellow judge because of immorality or bribery or whatever. So my question to you guys is, uh, would that have been constitutional? Because uh, this is actually kind of touching on the legal memorandum questions. What do you think? Scott, then you yes. Scott? Yeah, um uh, Scott, well then, yeah. Um, yeah, it would be legal if the Parliament, uh, both houses of the Parliament applied to the Governor-General, then the Governor-General would have the authority to remove the justice under the Constitution. Okay. Does the... So how exactly does that work? Um, well, Section 72 of the Constitution gives the Governor-General uh, the power to remove the justice when uh, when that that application has been made to the governor general by both houses of parliament, there is a requirement there. What's the requirement? There is a twin. Uh, 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 Justice of the high court and of uh, the other courts created by the parliament shall not be removed except by the governor governor general uh, in council on address from both houses of the parliament in the same session praying for such removal on the ground of proved misbehaviour or incapacity. Okay, good. So that's the twin requirement there. Okay. So before judges of the High Court or other federal courts can be removed, the requirement of Section 72 is that it must be upon the action of uh, both Houses of Parliament on the grounds as stated in Section 72. Okay, good. So we could probably leave that question now. Thank you, Scott. Um, question three is actually related. It's just about, you know, Cormac versus Scope, which again supports uh, Robert. Yeah, I was actually going to mention this one partly in relation to the last question where yeah. this 
talks about this would be the courts interfering with the making of the law rather than acting in their own jurisdiction of interpreting or mm. uh, looking at a law once it's passed for them to involve themselves. And that's why they refused to grant injunctions in uh, prior to the well done. 75 constitutional crisis because you can't, uh, a court can't comment on a law that doesn't exist. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. That's right. So, um, Robert, um, could you just say more about what you just said? So at what point can the judiciary get involved and at what point can't it not? Once, once the double dissolution election had been held in 74, 75, they were happy to present their opinion on what had occurred, but not beforehand. Okay, very good. And in relation to what Janet Bracken had stated in the chat box, and she was referring to the legality of laws. So if somebody, let's assume that um, some member of parliament as in Cormac versus Cope, felt that a law was about to be passed that did not comply with the requirements of the Constitution. And it was, it was close to being submitted to the Governor General for his assent. The question then is, would it be permissible, how, or how likely would the High Court uh, rule favorably upon a, an application to nullify a, a proceeding uh, seeking to enact such a law if it does not comply. So from Robert. Uh, Robert, did you, did you get my? Oh, where's that yes, phone? sorry, my phone, my phone's ringing at the same time. Okay. Um, yes. What it would still, I believe, it would still be interfe interference by the court if the governor general has not given their assent. It would be still premature for the court mm. to try and comment on a law that is not, you know, without the Governor General's assent, it's not officially law. Very good. So it would be premature. It's not a law. Somebody said something about it being hypothetical, as from Chantel. Um, the requirement of the Constitution is that under Section 75 is the High Court has jurisdiction only in relation to matter. So it's not a matter for as long as it is not a law, because it cannot lead to an actual controversy. So it would be hypothetical, and uh, it would also be to interfere with the, uh, with the workings of Parliament if the High Court were to step in to compel them to kind of uh, address a, a possible uh, shortcoming in the way that a law may have been passed. So the, the, the courts will only uh, step in once a law has been passed. But before that, it would be premature for the, law, for the courts to step in. Okay. Question number four. Uh, how many questions do we have? Four, five, six, six forty-five. Okay. Um, I've only got we've only got fifteen minutes. Do you think we could just skip this? I'd like to go to question five. Then we'll go back to question four in the event we've got time because I'm looking. I'm conscious that we've only got fourteen minutes to go. And because I find questions five and six a bit more interesting, I'm, I'm providing the answer to question four anyway at the end of the week. Okay, question five. The parliament passed a law that whenever a vacancy happens in the House of Representatives within nine months prior to a general election for the House of Representatives, a member of parliament may be appointed by the governor general on the advice of the prime minister to fill that vacancy. Rule on the validity of such a law. Would anyone care to answer? Question five. Rule on the validity of such a law. B, would you like to um, say something? Use the mic. You say it's invalid, why? Yeah, uh, I think I already posted it. I can't remember completely, but I, there's no way in the constitution that actually allows for a casual vacancy to be filled in the House of Representatives, only in the Senate. Mm. So um, it's not in the Constitution that you can fill. So the only way is to either hold a by-election 
but mm -hmm. also the constitution makes no mention that the seat has to be filled. So you can just leave it vacant or you can hold a by-election. Uh, that's the only two options. Okay, so assuming that the department felt <coughs> that the um, seat had to be filled, can the seat be filled by this process? No. Why, why not again? Because why, why can't an appointment be made by the Governor General if they pass a law? Well, because it would be against the Constitution where it says that the people in the House of Representatives have to be elected. They can't be appointed. Ah, okay. Okay. So that's because under Section 24, as pointed out by B, uh, members of the Parliament can only be elected, shall be directly chosen by the people of the Commonwealth. That's the requirement. Or the, directly chosen by the people of the state, in the case of the Senate. So an appointment is invalid. A law would be invalid if it were passed to that effect. It has to be through an election because that's only the way uh, that uh, members of parliament uh, will then be directly chosen by the people. Okay, so an appointment would be invalid. Um, I think I saw Monica raising her hand. Monica, did you want to pursue the point? Yeah, I was just going to say that it, would be, it wouldn't be very fair for the Prime Minister to be able to advise of who would fill the vacancy because he's obviously going to pick someone ah. um, that would support him. He's not going to pick, if there was an opposition seat, he'd fill it with his own party. He wouldn't pick an opposition, so it wouldn't really be fair. Very good. Um, can somebody make a comment about an argument raised by Monica here? that it would not be fair. Would anyone care to make a comment on that? If that were the answer, that it is not fair, if that were permitted because it would allow the, the Prime Minister to you know, ch make, choose a person who obviously will do his bidding. So he could, he could in a sense, uh, pack uh, vacant seats with people of his choice, of his own political persuasion. So the argument is based on the notion of fairness. Can somebody make a comment about that? So if you had a legal memory of assessment question or final written assessment question, is that a good argument to make? Because it is not fair. That's fine, Brad. Thank you. Glad to have you. Comments? Would it be because it's not constitutional? It's not moral? Um, go on. What, what do you mean by that? It's not constitutional. What does it mean? Well, isn't the meaning of constitutional the concept of being uh, morality and, you know, ethical? Okay. So the, 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 the question of race... Yes. <laughs> yeah. The question I'm raising is, um, how you know, given a legal question, is it proper to answer a legal question by providing an, an answer on the basis of morality or on the basis of fairness? Can you can you respond to a legal question by asserting that it is not fair? It is not. It is immoral. That's my question. Can I change it to um, undemocratic? Is that better? No, it's not. <laughs> um, Manjo, I might just, I might just add. Um, Manjo, it's Manjo, Kim. Sorry, sorry. Manjo. Um, that the, the other thing to comment on, on, on fairness, if you were to permit an argument on fairness, yes. is that the, the Constitution permits the filling of a casual vacancy in relation to the Senate. And I'm just briefly looking at the section. I haven't researched it. But of course, if there's a Senate vacancy, the governor, the governor of the state um, will, will name the replacement. And just in, in discussion of what happens if it was someone from the other party, well, I can't see anywhere in my very brief search here which says that it has to be replaced by the, a person from the same party who... who who caused the vacancy? I think that's obviously done through convention for very good reasons. But 
I think perhaps that that's, that would also be an argument against uh, referring to fairness or otherwise, because the Constitution certainly doesn't care in relation to the Senate. Okay. Um, the, the, uh, okay. I, I won't make a comment yet. I saw kind of Luke and somebody else. Again, the, the hand disappeared. So there was somebody before Luke, but the hand disappeared. Me? Who was that? Maybe, maybe I could... Um, I, I wouldn't say it's unfair. I would say it's un, unlawful or it be, it's uh, in breach of the Constitution. So you have uh, 20, Section 24, which outlines uh, the, the, how the, it, it, they have to be elected by the members. And then you have anything that um, if, if something is expressly mentioned in an act and statutory interpretation says, then the opposite is expressly, is expressly prohibited. So this says they have to be elected, therefore uh, a person can't just become a member of the House of Representatives without being elected. Very good. That was the, an that was the answer I was waiting for from Scott. So if you make an argument, make an argument by saying that it is unlawful, it is invalid, it is unconstitutional, but you cannot couch your argument on the basis that it is unfair or it's immoral or, or it's undemocratic because those are not legal arguments. Fairness can be applied uh, in, the notion, in, in the context of administrative law, in the notion of, in the case of natural justice, for example, but in relation to constitutional law questions, you can only uh, base your answer on the basis of what the constitution says, or perhaps on the, ba well, and definitely on the basis of what the high court has decided on the subject. But avoid um, basing your argument on principles such as it is not fair, or it is undemocratic, or it is immoral, because um, that is not a legal answer. I'm, I'm just um, politely saying that, so don't be offended. Um, I, I, again, uh, I'm pointing that out because I don't want to see it in a uh, in a legal memorandum answer, and neither do they have a place in a, the Moodle discussion questions, except to the extent that you make an argument that, you know, having, doing this kind of contravenes the, the notions of constitutionalism, which are founded on the ideas of blah, 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 blah. That is a constitutional law answer. But if you base it solely on the idea of fairness, which again is very subjective, or the notions of morality, which again are quite slippery, we don't know what they mean, they're elusive. So we avoid uh, making an argument on the basis that it's unfair. And certainly not, as part about, you can't say it's just the vibe of it. How oh, was that? As in the castle. Okay, I missed that. Okay, so I'm not very familiar with the, um, some of the traditions in the Australia yet, but okay, I, take, I think I take your point there. Okay, final question for tonight. Um, discussion question six. So, uh, it's quite a long question. Have you read this? Should I read it? So, a 17-year-old Australian, I'll just do it quickly. A 17-year-old Australian citizen joined the Australian Defence Force, arguing that if he's old enough to die for his country, he should be old enough to vote. He sought enrolment to vote to the Australian Electoral Commission for the 2014 special election. The AEC declined his application to enroll to vote for the 2000 special elections on the ground that the Commonwealth Electoral Act uh, 1918 required a minimum age of 18 to vote. He filed an action in the High Court, questioning the constitutionality of said law. He claimed that the law violates Section 7 and 24 of the Australian Constitution, which guarantees that members of Parliament shall be directly chosen by the people, rule on the validity of such a law. He's actually making argument as well that there is a right of universal suffrage in Australia. Okay, what do you think? What's that? You should rent it, Manjo. Is that, is that a movie? <laughs> okay, yes. Um... Would anyone want to answer the question? I'll have a go at that one. I um, unfortunately haven't read this entire chapter yet, uh, but it would come back largely to the same argument as the last question where it would be plainly unconstitutional because the constitution doesn't guarantee the vote to write, the right to vote, my apologies, to you just because you're a member of the defense force it's because you're not 18. Mm. okay 
but it, it goes back to that question. Uh, sorry, again, I can't see the chat box here. There's a lot of statements there. But I can't read it. Um, it goes back to the question, would it be within the power of the, of the Commonwealth Parliament to actually determine at what age people could vote? Because um, the Constitution clearly says that um, the members of Parliament are directly chosen by the people. And so who, what do we mean by people here? Is there a requirement that they have to be 18? His argument, the, the argument of the soldier is that if he could die for his country at 17, surely he should be given the right to vote even if he's 17. So wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't that be in breach of the Constitution, which guarantees that, you know, that members of Parliament can be directly chosen by the people? He's part of the people. So shouldn't he be allowed to vote? So that it is unlawful, therefore, for, for, for Parliament to say that somebody who's 17 cannot vote or should not be entitled to vote. Whose answer was this? B. Or Robert, do you want to pursue the point? Similar to the last answer, it's probably not fair that he doesn't get to vote, but that's not the point. Um, yeah. the, the majority in McKinley um, found that the Constitution doesn't guarantee a universal right of suffrage. Uh, okay, very good. Yes, um, I, I saw Kim raising his hand. Um, I was just going to point to uh, Section 41 of the Constitution, which says that no adult person who has or acquires a right to vote at the elections, blah, 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 would be pre prevented by any law of the Commonwealth from voting at elections. Um, so certainly that um, contemplates uh, adult persons um, being prevented from voting by law. And how do we know who is, who is an adult? Who defines that? That would be defined by legislation. Okay, so it's for Parliament to decide. Is, there, is this stated in the Constitution? Is there a recognition in the Constitution that the Parliament can actually define the qualifications of voters or electors? Uh, sorry, I'll just suggest that I don't think that's quite right, that the, the Parliament could pass the law to define a term in the Constitution. I think the High Court I think the High Court would interpret it in whatever way they saw fit mm. um, based on what they thought the intention of, of yes. the, the Parliament that passed the Constitution was. Okay. So uh, the, the question I had was, would it be within the power of Parliament to, to determine who is an adult? Um, Manjo, yes. In, in, the, in the Constitution, does it not then delegate powers to be set by the executive. So the executive has made, um, made the law in relation to who can vote, who's an adult, etc. So then you would have to then be disputing um, the power of the executive under the delegation that it's received from the Constitution. So is it the executive or the parliament that does that? Or the Parliament. So yeah, sorry. So so the Parliament has the power to make that law, which was delegated to it by the Constitution. Okay. Yeah, but I, I go back to the question uh, and the point raised by Kim. Would there is it actually within the power? Would it be within the power of the Parliament to decide who is an adult for the purpose of the right to vote, for the purpose of voting? Would it be within the power of the parliament actually to define who is an adult? Well, the question would be what gives the right to the state to then make a decision as to an adult being a 17 year old under the criminal code? Ah. What difference? So the powers have been delegated by the constitution to parliament to be able to make those decisions. Ah. Okay. Um, because we're running out of time, it's 7.02. I'd like to point out that Section 30 of the Australian Constitution uh, gives to the Commonwealth Parliament the power to define um, the qualifications of voters. So for that purpose, if they say that um, somebody has to be 18 to vote, that is within their power, recognized by Section 30 of the Constitution. Now, as we've seen in the case of McKinley, it's not as uh, extensive as that because they can't arbitrarily 
uh, define qualifications of voters, for example, so that if uh, somebody, for example, has uh, been has been convicted of the crime, for example, of, of theft, and that would then mean that that person is disenfranchised from voting, the court in uh, the high court in other cases has struck down that kind of legislation because of the recognition that uh, people have the right to vote for members of parliament. Okay, so. Although Section 30 provides for the power of the uh, Commonwealth Parliament to define the qualifications of the voters, that is not an unlimited power. It cannot be ex exercised arbitrarily so that uh, the Parliament will then come up with certain qualifications such as requiring, for example, that somebody has a university degree in order to vote or somebody has, um, is not on the benefit in order to vote. Uh, that will be struck down as unconstitutional. So the, the High Court in McKinley has uh, pointed out that it has to be for valid reasons that uh, a, a certain person may lose the right to vote. Um, okay, is Kim still raising his hand? Now, in relation to the point uh, made by Brad, we make a distinction between um, the, the voting in federal elections and voting in state elections because as far as votes for um, members of the Commonwealth Parliament are concerned, then we are governed by the Australian Commonwealth Constitution. But as far as the states are concerned, uh, what, what we need to remember is that state constitutions are actually creations of the, com of, of the state parliament. So they can change it. And if they did, uh, it will actually be uh, not within the power of their state courts to actually invalidate a, a law passed by the state, mainly because, as we said, while the separation, the partial separation of powers may exist in, um, in the Commonwealth, at the level of the states, uh, the notion of um, separation of powers does not exist. And secondly, the notion of parliamentary supremacy exists so that because in the first place, state courts are actually creations of state parliaments, unlike Commonwealth courts, which are creations of the constitution, state, uh, state courts are creations of the parliament. State courts, therefore, uh, actually, in a sense, are controllable by state parliaments. And so, therefore, it is difficult for state parliaments to invalidate state legislation, except to the extent that state legislation may contravene the Commonwealth Constitution or uh, may, common, may contravene a law passed by, uh, by the Commonwealth. But certainly, uh, it is not within the power of state courts to invalidate laws passed by state parliament. So therefore, if, the state, if a state parliament passes legislation saying that uh, it has the age, uh, that the state voters must be the age of 21 for them to vote in state elections, state courts will not have the power to strike that down because that is a state election that we're talking of. Okay, so you have to be clear about making a distinction uh, as to whether or not, and this is crucial for the legal memorandum question as well, it, it will be crucial for you to make a distinction as to whether or not what is happening is occurring within the Commonwealth or within the state. Because if it is within the state, there is no separation of power and there is parliamentary supremacy there. Uh, but not in the case of uh, not in the case of the Commonwealth, where the High Court, with a base of the Constitution, has the power to invalidate laws passed by the Commonwealth Parliament. So that has to be clarified. Okay, seven oh six. I understand some of you have to go. Um, any questions before we end uh, tonight's session? There was a question earlier raised by somebody, and I couldn't find the question anymore. Um, could somebody? Who was that? Somebody raised a question earlier and said I was going to go back to it. Would anyone want to raise that again before we end tonight's session? Because I can't remember what the question was. I said I was going to go back to it. I can't remember what it was. There was a private message. It disappeared. So I don't know where it is. So we're probably good. It's 7.07. Okay. So thank you very much uh, for tonight's session. And I'll be posting the um, legal memorandum assessment task by tomorrow. And uh, have a great weekend. And thank you for joining us at tonight's tutorial again. Thank you and good night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.